In this video, we're going to look at op-amp circuits for low noise and variable gain amplifiers. Here's an example of a general inverting configuration that can be used to amplify relatively weak input voltage signals. For low noise amplifiers, we may need to handle a wide range of input voltage amplitudes. So therefore, it's common to require the gain to be variable. An inverting configuration like this, the gain can be made variable by adjusting either the impedance Z1 or the impedance Z2. Now the reason to do this is because when we have a very low input signal, we need to have as much gain as possible while still maintaining low noise at the input. Whereas if the input changes and becomes very large, then in order to avoid saturating the amplifier or otherwise exciting nonlinearities in the circuit, we would uh, usually decrease the gain somehow. So being able to vary the gain of a stage like this ensures we have the widest possible dynamic range. Naturally, there'll be noise in this circuit introduced by the op amp itself. We've already talked about noise models for op amp and dominant noise sources from op amps. But depending on how uh, we realize the impedance of Z1 and Z2, they may also introduce noise. For example, if resistors are used for Z1 and Z2, like this, then they will naturally have their own associated thermal noise. As we know, these thermal noise sources are white. Here I've used the Norton equivalent noise source. Um, so this one will have a noise spectral density of 4 kT over R2. Performing a noise analysis of this circuit would reveal that these two thermal noise sources have associated with them an input referred noise spectral density uh, given by that expression there. In order to find the total noise in the circuit, we need to integrate these noise spectral densities over the closed loop bandwidth of the stage, which assuming a single stage op amp with a transconductance GM depends in turn on GM over CL. In sum, it's quite likely that the thermal noise contributions of R1 and R2 are significant, if not dominant, in the noise analysis of a circuit like this. An alternative that's often used when low noise performance is really important is to use capacitors for Z1 and Z2, C1 and C2 as shown here. Capacitors introduce no thermal noise on their own. So this results in improved noise performance. You're left in this circuit only with the noise introduced by the op amp itself. However, just looking at this circuit on its own reveals a problem. For example, if you consider this node right here, you'll notice that there's no DC connection to this node. In a sense, it's a floating node. So there's no way to ensure that its DC operating point will be at a voltage that ensures proper operation of the op amp itself. So if the op amp's not operating properly, then there's in turn no way that it can ensure via feedback the virtual ground at the negative op amp terminal. And the op amp can just saturate. However, such circuits still arise often in practice. In some cases, these are switch capacitor circuits. So the schematic as it's shown here only arises temporarily and periodically switches are closed to sample the input voltage on the capacitor C1 and to reset the voltage at this node here, allowing it to establish a good DC operating point. Now, if switches are being used, then you may rightly note that the switches themselves will have an on resistance that will in turn reintroduce thermal noise into the circuit. This is true. However, the switches can typically be sized to have a small enough value so that their thermal noise contribution is negligible. In fact, you could argue that they have to be sized that way because otherwise the settling time associated with the time constant of the switch resistance and the capacitances they're connected to would be too slow 
for proper operation of the circuit. So again, in summary, a circuit like this with capacitors used in the feedback network can provide a low noise amplifier stage dominated by the noise contributed by the op-amp itself. We've already seen how a noise analysis of this stage, assuming a single stage op-amp here, um, gives rise to an expression that depends only on the transconductance of the op-amp GM and capacitor C1. So these two design variables, therefore, you know, can be used to establish a desired noise level at the input. Specifically, the capacitance values are chosen to ensure desired noise level and the transconductance of the stage is chosen to ensure desired bandwidth. When a switched capacitor implementation isn't possible, another solution to the DC biasing problem is to introduce a very large value resistance here in parallel with the feedback capacitor, C2. This provides a DC path from the op-amp output to its negative input terminal, which through which current can flow to establish an initial DC operating point around the uh, virtual ground of the op-amp. However, with respect to the input signal, you'll notice that this R large introduces a high pass response to the circuit, which attenuates signals below one over two pi R large times C2. So in order to amplify low frequency signals, this time constant has to be made very large, which in turn requires a very large value of the resistor here. This can be a bit of a practical problem very large value resistors and in integrated circuits can consume a large amount of area. In some implementations, they replace R large with a MOSFET biased in subthreshold. This can provide a very weak conductive path from the op-amp output to the negative terminal that allows some small current to flow and establish a proper operating point here, but without too much area. There still does remain a lower cutoff frequency, so note that such signals can't be used to amplify uh, input signals all the way down to DC. Next, let's talk a little bit more about how to use this low noise amplifier circuit, but uh, augmented to provide a programmable gain. You've got two options here. The gain in bend depends on the ratio C1 over C2. So you can either change the gain by changing C2, or by changing C1. Now, if you change C2, notice that the bandwidth and settling time of the op-amp circuit, the overall closed loop bandwidth and settling time, depends on the ratio of GM of the OTA divided by C1. So that's kept constant when you adjust C2. Moreover, the open loop unity gain frequency is also kept constant. And as a result, the phase margin kept, is kept constant. So there's no need to worry about changing the loop dynamics as you adjust for different gain. However, remember that the lower cutoff frequency formed by R large and C2 uh, is still there. So as you change C2, that lower cutoff frequency will change. If you think about the closed loop response of the circuit, it's got this lower cutoff frequency, one over R large C2. And it's got a mid band gain of C1 over C2. So as you increase C2, you drop the mid-band gain and you lower the cutoff frequency. So you can realize a family of curves like this. In some applications, this may be a drawback. If you want to maintain a constant lower cutoff frequency, you're not going to do that if you're varying uh, C2 and keeping everything else constant. The noise contribution of R large is insignificant compared to the thermal noise of the op amp itself. So 
The preferred noise of this circuit is 4 pi kT gamma over C1, just as it is for the circuit without R large. So if we're changing the gain by playing with C2, the input referred noise stays the same. Now, at first glance, this may seem like a benefit because the noise performance remains constant over the gain range, but actually it's kind of inefficient because if you think about the situation where you realize variable gain in an amplifier to maintain a high dynamic range, you're probably doing it because the input amplitude is varying. When you have high gain, that corresponds to the case where you have a small input amplitude, and therefore that's where you need the smallest input referred noise. When the gain decreases, that's probably because the input amplitude is increased. And in that situation, you could probably put up with more input referred noise. In a perfect world, you'd somehow take advantage of that to save power in the high gain settings. But using this configuration, that doesn't happen. The noise performance is always the same as you vary C2. So you have to over-design the noise performance in all gain settings, except for the high gain setting. Essentially, you have to select the GM of the op amp so that you meet the noise spec in the high gain case, and then you're just over-designed in all the other cases. The alternative is to realize the programmable gain by adjusting C1. Here, the benefits are exactly the opposite of the last case. The lower cutoff frequency formed by R large and C2 now stays the same over all gain settings. Moreover, the highest gain setting is when C1 is the largest. That's also when you've got the best noise performance. The noise performance automatically changes with the gain setting as you vary C1 in just the way you'd like. It's a higher input referred noise and lower gain settings. On the other hand, the bandwidth, settling time, and phase margin may all vary with the gain setting since they generally depend on the GM of the OTA and C1. Some designers have tried to take advantage of this fact by designing the op amp to automatically reconfigure itself in the low gain setting to have a lower GM and thereby save power in the low gain settings. Clearly, that'll complicate the internal design of this op amp.